Perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you're all having a great uh, afternoon, evening, or late night, depending on your location. Today we'll be discussing um, a topic um, concerning the digital twin, and I will be showcasing an approach that Moicon is leveraging uh, to achieve specific goals within manufacturing and AEC industry. Um, my name is Torbjörn, I'm tuning in from Norway, which is where Moicon is based out of, and um, I will go ahead and show you this uh, presentation um, that is currently not, yeah, so this presentation regarding digital twins, and I think it's very, very, very interesting to be here on a hackathon and discussing digital twin technology because uh, if you ask 10 people about what is a digital twin, you'd probably get 20 answers. And I think that's a very good thing about this technology because it means that there are so many ways of approaching it. That means that there are so many outputs you can get and so many um, uh, problems you can solve. So. We like to define the use cases for a digital twin in this way, and I'll go ahead and do some slides related to this digital twin content and how, how we are interpreting digital twin. And then I'll be going into some uh, videos and some illustrations of how we are specifically working with the digital twin technology, merging it with gamification, as Catherine mentioned in the intro, how we are mixing this together to achieve what we want. So the possibilities you get when you connect your 3D model to some data sources that's what you can achieve with a digital twin so the result is basically a dynamic representation of your factory floor or your building or your facility or your asset or your room that you can go ahead and use so i'll do a brief introduction about the digital twin concept and this is how moicon is interpreting the um, digital twin so we split it into its two uh, respective words the digital and the twin and what you can see here is that the way we like to um, leverage the digital part of this concept, the software part, is that we want to achieve a two-way communication uh, between the physical environment and the virtual model, meaning you can communicate from sensors, uh, it can be communicated to the model and from the model. Uh, it's also software, you can communicate from software to the digital twin and from the digital twin to the software. So you have this bi-directional connection there. Later in this, uh, in this uh, talk, I will show you some examples of how we are leveraging specific Autodesk technology for this purpose. Moicon is a partner of Autodesk and we leverage a lot of those legal blocks that you might are familiar with through Autodesk Forge. Uh, the next bullet point here is simulation of various scenarios. Um, this is highly relevant. It means that you can simulate your process or your layout, uh, your prototype. You do all these things virtually uh, before you apply them in the physical environment. Decision, su uh, decision support functionalities. Basically, all decision-making activities could be applied in a digital um, atmosphere. Uh, so, for example, there will be some analytics, whether you're working with a building or a factory, there are always some data going on in the corridors, so those data would have a dashboard where they can be easily read by the user. Um, it's important. Then we have the twinning concept, which is more of the geometry and what you actually see with your eyes. So we have a replica of the physical assets, as I mentioned, your, your, your building, uh, your room, your factory, your environment, your city, uh, you have a replica of this. That can come in different CAD, for CAD models. You might be familiar with Revit, which is BIM models. You might get your model from Unreal Engine, Unity, Blender, 3ds Max, all these available models. And then the last bullet point is the high fidelity. It's, that one is extremely important for Moicon. I think that's really what we try to uh, separate our approach with. It means high quality on the model. So we focus very much on gamification. Uh, we want to apply the same kind of engagement to the models as games do in their models. Uh, and I'll get, give you more information on why we emphasize this so much, but high fidelity is, is very important for us. Uh, and you, some may ask, uh, can't we already do this with CAD? Can't we just uh, 
like the architects do, they plan the models in CAD, um, and they look at the assets in context with other assets, and I agree, that's a very good solution for planning. But when you want to start the interaction between human, machine, and processes, then you need to unlock a higher level uh, of tech, uh, technology. Um, that's where the digital twin comes, comes into play. So you kind of uh, unlocks the new level from planning to operation, and there you have this dynamic model which can basically do and output the information that's vital for you. So we build this uh, 3D model. Uh, you, some of you might, might be architects or some of you might be familiar with doing modeling. When you have this geometry, that's step one. Step two is bring that up to the digital twin and that geometry that you did model is now containers for data. It means that uh, the robot in your scene is no longer a robot with just beam information, but it can contain facility man management information, uh, telling you when it should be maintained. It can contain sensor information. It can contain uh, uh, stress information, etc. So these two bullet points are highly, highly uh, relevant for the digital twin. The next, or the also the next bullet point that I think is highly important is the communication part. That's that must be the main reason you want to establish a digital twin is because you want to communicate something from your data. So digital twin is basically something that you look at to get status of something. So it communicates data. Uh, you have, let's say you have an Excel sheet with data. Uh, it's not communicating uh, the data to you in an intuitive way. If you loop this Excel through a digital twin and you can look straight into the digital twin and within two, three seconds, you can get the help status of your data because it will show you colors and context that you would not be able to see in the Excel sheet. So what we're doing actually is leveraging the potential of the existing data. One example is a robot, which I mentioned earlier. Let's say you have your robot uh, or you have your uh, thing. And then uh, in the robot scenario, you have engineering building the robots. You have after the architects were drawing it. Then you have technicians equipping sensors to the robot. At this point, you have a complex and robust uh, robot with data flowing, but it's isolated. So you want to unlock this new level where you uh, transmit this data that's uh, been communicated inside this one into the factory floor of the building. So this robot is actually in context of all the other processes. So this illustration here just shows a uh, temperature and uh, that it has been maintained, this box, um, that's very relevant information if you are producing a product and this is a vital process that it, it will be going through. So uh, gamification is the way to actually engage and motivate the users to use the software because the digital twin is a concept that I think is uh, one of the top trending tech terms of 2020 uh, it is according to google so it means it's it's up there it's a part of the three top things people look at right now you have ai you have digital twins and the reason for it is because of um the the user friendliness when you have a tool that has been leveraged by users then it's actually giving you value and the reason it's leveraged by users is because people are motivated to start using it and that goes for people with technical skill, but also without technical skills. So I think traditionally within AEC and manufacturing, the system that are applied to buildings and uh, factories, they are kind of, uh, user interface hasn't been in focus. So it means the data is not democratized. It means maybe the data is reserved for the administration or people with trading, but you could not simply give an iPad to someone and tell them to start using this system. With Digital Twin, you actually can. Uh, and Moikon strongly believes that if we bring gamification to the mix, then we uh, kind of can hook this up to a new level because gamification is all about bring, taking elements from games that we see here to uh, uh, unlock a new engagement for the end user. And then we can implement this motivational approach to different industries, AEC, buildings, um, factories. So 
the focus on ensuring that data is pre presented in an intuitive manner is interesting. And I think uh, as we're here now on a hackathon, I think it's very interesting to look into and do a little talk about how do we do this? Well, the answer is we're kind of building Moicon similar to how you would build and prepare your assets for a game. Uh, our designer is coming from uh, Counter-Strike as an example, and that, that is deliberate because he has so much knowledge about how assets are prepared in a game so that they can be user-friendly. And I think bring that kind of uh, um, fourth set into the mix here uh, is very relevant. So when it comes to the workflow, it's actually very simple. Um, there are some technical details around how we process different steps, but these are the headlines. So we define the components. It means we don't have to do it. You can do it. You have your model, then you map out what's the rooms, what's the or the floors, the walls, the assets, the shares. Uh, the ceiling, the beaming, etc. You define those and then just drag and drop it into, for example, Moicon, which is the deliverer uh, or the producer of this digital twin concept. So you drag and drop it in there and then you connect the data. So the data you defined in step one and here you can connect it to different sources. So meaning it can start to do its job because your data that you define in one, they are no containers. So those will visualize the kind of data that you wanted to visualize. You have an ID for your component, and now that ID can look for information for sensor, system, operator, all interactions that goes through this idea will be saved in the database and it will never go away. So it's kind of investing in an ongoing operation of your asset. Step four, you can test it and then validate it and then um, do, use it for your use case, whether that's uh, trying to find a workflow for a pro pro uh, product that you want to produce, or whether it's for planning a new layout in your factory building, or whether it's for operational purpose, you actually want to uh, uh, get a better performance out of your factory or your building. Virtual testing, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very important. So as, as it says here in the text, uh, even today's 2020 technology, still rel rely on a form of trial and error. So it means in the physical environments, uh, operators are testing and they're doing trial and error and they may, might be doing this 100 times and they found this one thing that works. One, one example is when you relocate your assets, but with this virtual digital twin, uh, we do not need to redevelop this costly physical uh, process. Um, we can do it by leveraging technology, uh, our digital twin, which is a replica of the physical environment. So in our case, we leverage Autodesk Forge and Autodesk technology to do these things. Um, and I encourage you all to look into it and some of you might even have. And it's uh, a great kind of tool set where you have your Lego blocks and you can just pick parts that you want and put it together in your uh, production, in your app. Um, and ultimately, the reason for it is to lead to better products or more efficient work environment, or you want to solve your problems that occur for you every Monday to Friday, but you want to do the testing virtual before you go, go and do it physical. Here's one example. This is a product life cycle. So we are developing the product and, uh, and then you introduce it to the market and it has, it's growing in the market. And then it reaches its maturity and then it's the clients. And that's the lifetime of the product. Uh, and here you can see that virtual testing is playing a big role in, uh, in the uh, initial states of, uh, of this um, uh, product development or the life cycle of the product. And there you can see the, the biggest difference in cost is there because you're doing these things virtually before you're doing it physically. Uh, I mentioned Autodesk Forge uh, already, already, and um, one of the key uh, points I would like to mention to you is something called design automation. Um, that's something that I think can solve so many problems. And uh, it uh, the, so basically, what it is that you are familiar with all these traditional desktop applications like Revit, AutoCAD, Civil 3D, uh, 3ds Max, Inventor. So what Autodesk is doing now is they're pushing this tech to the cloud 
what that means is that you can actually leverage all the features in the softwares in the cloud that uh, unlocks an insane amount of mobility so that's what we're doing um, and uh, this is a fact there is no technology in the entire world which can handle 3d and 2d operation in a synchronized symbiosis uh, in the cloud like design automation so it's kind of like very unique in its shape and form and uh, we'll be showing you some examples um, um, before we wrap this talk up uh, about how we are actually leveraging this in a production environment <clears throat> and uh, this is the most important thing uh, digital twins they're there to solve problems for the clients that's 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 the goal if they're not solving problems they're not uh, yeah leaving to the potential that we want them to do so we applied digital twin technology to 25 uh, clients and the the reduction of costs uh, went down and that is mainly because of they uh, improved the operation routines it can be by just having insight into the data flowing through the factory but it can also be uh, uh, in the sense that you're reducing waste uh, that's also increasing your revenue so if you are a manufacturer of course you're using some raw material and then you you don't want waste but uh, it's no secret that they're always waste but if you can reduce this waste then you have more material that you can produce more products out of and that's a part of the uh, yeah how they're utilizing technology here to get improved revenue for their factory so i was showing you four screenshots now just from our application just to give you a sense of how it's looking before i go into some videos here you can see a simple sensor dashboard this is open in your favorite browser whether that's chrome or firefox or Safari, if you are using iOS, maybe you're using the new Edge browser, uh, you're opening that up and uh, in the right hand side there are some sensors and those are like, those are put into place once you are looping the data into the software and once they are there, they can be dragged into the lower, uh, lower dashboard where you can monitor your sensor dashboard and look into the kind of data, the status that you want, whether that's for example, here you see humidity, temperature, carbon dioxide um, in building environments, as well as factories, that's relevant. Facility management, uh, of course, yeah, it's relevant for both AEC and manufacturing. Um, it's concerning both ticket systems where you can report issues, like in this example, you see there's an issue in the robot. It could be documentation oriented. You want to have some documentation related to your fire safety, your food safety, uh, your routines when it comes to evacuation. Uh, you want documentation related to products or robots. Uh, who should I call if this one breaks? What's the price? When did I order it last time? Etc. So here in the right hand side, you can see the ticket uh, tab is open. The maintenance is there also, which is basically uh, a UI showing showing um, intervals of maintenance, how and when they should be performed, with illustrational videos, etc. So people are this is like sending an SMS on your phone. So you tap on an object and then you write your ticket and it stores there in your um, memory. And then other people can go in and uh, have a look at it and help you out. Maybe you assign some people to it even. Data view. Here's, uh, there's a lot of IoT going on with digital twins and we have some, as you can see in the upper left ribbon, uh, header menu, there are a lot of like um, uh, toggles that are opening data containers, but uh, we are never leaving the 3D models, we're all, always just overlaying the data, so the 3D model is always in center. So what you're seeing here is, yeah, there's some data on the right hand side. In the lower center, we have a timeline. And that's actually storing all the data in your server. So when you want to retrieve the data into your view, then you can just uh, pick the period of time that you want, and then you can bring it into view. And it's basically taking that batch of data into the, into the model. And it will show you, like here, you see what kind of uh, 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 data trackers you had at the time, what kind of progress did it have at the different stations? 
KPI dashboards. I think this is this is presented in the, what I like to call a gamified way. KPI means key performance indicators, and uh, it is basically an indication of the most vital uh, performance for your environment. So we are just overlaying the data that you would maybe see in your app or uh, in a system, but we are overlaying it uh, just across the physical uh, environment that we see here represented in the virtual world. So it means that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to see, for example, how much uh, uptime you had in a specific equipment, you can look in here and you can estimate that after 1000 hours of running, this one is expected to break or I must perform service. And you can see here, 1000 hours, this one is set to give a notification to the operator that uh, you should look into this because the worst thing that can happen in a manufacturing environment is when things break. That is very expensive. Following up on the gamification, this is an image uh, showcasing how we're working. So what that, this is the gamification technique, but these are, this is also how you would do your uh, game-ready assets. So in the left, you can see the building and it's basically a very uh, low polygon. It means all the shapes and geometry you see here are limited um, because you know when you are moving your mouse around and uh, orbiting your model, the model is calculating every frame, all the vertices and polygons in the model. So you don't want any, you don't want any um, overuse of those. So what we do is we simplify the geometry, we simplify the mesh, and then the result you can see on the right hand side, it's, it's simplified mesh in the left, but when you apply techniques like, uh, we're using a workflow with Substance Designer, uh, we are bringing 3ds Max into the mix, and uh, we're, we're leveraging all the potentials that these material containers have, uh, like you wrap, you, you wrap them onto trees or grounds or pipes or buildings. And then you can, uh, you can actually get some very, very good looking assets. And um, the feedback is that this is important for the clients. It's visually, uh, visually easy to recognize the environment. And there's no doubt at all how you would inspect and navigate because you can by two seconds, you would know uh, where you are. And if you would like to look into some sockets or et cetera in here, then you can tap on it and it will be uh, textured and optimized and possible to inspect. Um, so this is a, a little bit more about the content. And this is a project that we have been doing these very days, um, very much related to the situation we're in. Uh, where where um, where there are contamination that we would like to um, remove, so we have uh, we have some uh, ways of illustrating contamination and sanitizing, and this is super basic, but it it's really a way to give you a health status in a room. So, for example, let's say this room hasn't been attended by any person today. There hasn't been any meeting here then you would know that since it was sanitized last time, this one is still um, in okay condition. So uh, the, the red room can be triggered by, for example, a high level of CO2, which means that there have been a lot of people in the room and the carbon dioxide that we breathe out has been rising, or it can actually detect toxins directly. So we have sensors for toxins, um, uh, etc. So it can be used uh, in that manner. Uh, so this is like a visual reference for the visitors or the cleaning personnel, etc. A simple example. Um, some other examples here. Uh, it's all about visualizing data. So here we are showing you a point cloud. This point cloud has 100 million points. So that is basically just a color and a position. Uh, 100 million points with a color in a specific position put into a system. So uh, we did it because uh, if we were to bring our 3D model into the scene, that would be very uh, heavy for the browser to compute. So we brought in something called Pottery, which is a, a viewer showcasing point clouds. 
and then we merged it with a, a 3D viewer so that you can kind of overlay your 3D buildings in a point cloud environment. And uh, like showing you now, we're simply just navigating through the point cloud. Uh, we can set point sizes and point density. At the moment, I'm just visualizing 5 million points, not 100, just to show you how, how the difference is. Uh, this was created by a drone that flew over the area and just uh, hit with a laser all the areas. Um, so we use this in kind of like industrial parks. Uh, this is this is a LOD system, level of detail, where you it's like when you navigate Google uh, Google Earth, you see the world and you zoom into your village or your city, and then you zoom even more in, and then you get all down to Earth. So it's, uh, it's the same thing here. You can click yourself into the building and then you start uh, uh, excluding all the other data and visualizing that data for you. Um, next example is uh, design automation, which I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, it's how we are synchronizing your 3D file to the 2D model. So here you can see that we toggle up the 2D file. This is a DVG that you can open up in uh, AutoCAD. So it's uh, so we do some let's say we do some layout changes etc and we make some changes then the 2D model will recognize this because it's synchronized and you can download it from the interface and you can open it directly in AutoCAD or your favorite 2D viewer. Um, let's say you want to do a layout change or you want to uh, suggest something for shareholders then this is a feature that you can leverage to print out your 2D layouts. Uh, this is uh, just an example showing a real life case where we took an existing building and turned it into this 3D model. So we flew here also with a drone and then we made the 3D model and this is where the data starts to become live. Uh, this example is showcasing how you're entering our system. So you join or you click into your domain and then you log in. Um, and then you get a list of all your buildings presented so that you can start interact with your models. Uh, so here we see an empty factory floor and um, that's the reason for it because this is one of the layout planning features that we have. I'm bringing in here the assets that I got from the architect because I'm not yet sure. I just know I have these four walls and this floor and this roof, but I am not quite sure how I would equip the factory and how I would uh, yeah, define my layout in this factory. So what I do here is that I simply bring in all the assets that I want in the asset library and then I can start um, doing this layout planning here in the viewer and you see I, there's very basic tools we leverage. We, we use the gizmo which is the move tool and we use some very basic coordinate systems so it's sufficient for this kind of workflow because it will enable you to uh, equip your different layouts. When you do this, you can save the revisions and you can you can say, for example, factory one, two operators, one robot, factory three, one robot, four operators. Uh, and again, the reason we do this is because these assets become data containers. So it means once I have equipped my factory, then I will start to uh, perform some actions on top of the assets. So as far as you know, at the moment, this you could do in your Revit file or you could do it in Venter. Um, but what's, when it starts to get interesting is when you can apply process analysis and other kind of technology on top of your assets to get an impression of how is this layout actually running with the metrics that I am planning to use. So in a brief second now, I will show you just fast forward to a more complex model. So this is one revision that we made out of our current um, setup. So what we're seeing here now is there are some dynamics in models and uh, I'm thinking that the operators should be placed there northbound in model and uh, there should be a forklift 
uh, delivering the packages there, etc. This factory will actually be producing like um, uh, ships or um, uh, uh, data sockets. So uh, you can, when you have your model set, then you can start to equip the KPI dashboard to your scene, which basically gives you an impression of how things could be operating. If this is a production environment, then this would be real-time data. It's basically extracted data from the robots showing in here. So you can see different kind of uptime, downtime. Uh, you get the idea that this could basically be a dashboard that you customize yourself. It depends on the data you want to bring in. What we did is basically uh, create the containers that a gateway for the data. Uh, show you a little earlier uh, how we do it with maintenance. Here you can see two examples of it. You have these uh, assets that are requiring maintenance and you have the one that has been performed. And that's basically been uh, forwarded to the relevant resources because this is the part of the task management that we have. So it's a simplified version of giving uh, visitors or operators of the system an idea of how the health is looking, how the maintenance is looking. So now that we did equip our layout, or we actually have built the factory this way, um, we want to run our process. And uh, this is inspired by uh, Autodesk um, process analysis, which is an add-on you can get if you have Inventor. Uh, so it's a very intuitive way of running a configuration. Uh, so here he said, I would like to produce 50 assets. And here I'm putting in some metrics, how often is things supposed to fail, etc. And then when you did all these things, <coughs> the system in the background will run algorithms and it will be able to notify you if something is wrong. So now you can see that I'm running my pro uh, process analysis here in real time. So this is actually how fast it will run if my uh, uh, input are correct. So I can look into the algorithms doing its job and it will basically output information when it's relevant. So in a while we might see that some assets here are breaking or that is required tension. Uh, so here there is a process, um, you, can, you can go in, it's in failure and that's, that's because of this metric that we put in here that it's estimated to fail every 40 seconds and that's of course uh, too fast. This is a demo just showing you the idea. Mean time before failure and mean time before a repair means how often does it fail, how often does it expect to be repaired when it has failed. This is all terminology. Terminolo uh, so words from the um, process analysis um, subject that you can put in different operations etc so let's uh, build those 50 assets and then you see that i'm jumping into the screen and here you can see how many products uh, that i have been produced and it was produced six products every minute and here you can see the efficiency of the assets that was included in the configuration. You see it's only 40% efficient. It's idling a lot and it's actually down a lot. Uh, so I think some of the robots were waiting for too long. They had the potential to do more work related to how the configuration was working. Connectors, those are basically what's transporting your asset from one process to another process. Oh, this is okay, it's not optimal. Um, you could download this configuration and compare it with a new one. Our buffer stations, those are always full, so no problems there. Maybe I don't even need one of those. You can download this data here into a JSON file. If you want to import it into, like I said, process analysis or an external source, uh, most of the times they can read JSON. So it means that the data that you produce here can be leveraged in your third-party software. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, task um, management, but I'll show you just a very brief idea how easily it's done. You click on assets and you assign a person and then you save it. And then in this case, Diana Christiansen, she gets a notification that this truck needs oil replacement, um, meaning she can look into 
click on the truck or the forklift here and look into where is this uh, oil stored or if it's not stored in our facility, where can I buy it, etc. That data will be available to you as well. So let's move on to this day, this model that I briefly showed you earlier. Um, this is this is actually a technology center here in Norway. So it's very much a um, living model with a lot of data going on. So we want to visualize this, and the, re the way we do it is um, retrieving real sensor data. So here in the left you can see the virtual world, and in the right you can see the physical world, and uh, these assets, those are moving around pretty much every day. And uh, people want to be able to see how are these moving, where and in what context, etc. So here's an example where you are, uh, where we are walking around with one of those houses. And on the left hand side, you can see a streamline, which is actually tracking the location. So this is a real time position sensor that is equipped in the house that is um, mapped in a coordinate system in this room so in this video you can see i'm moving one house but in the real environment we are moving 16 and then every house has its own color in the streamlines here and then you can look into how that data is being uh, moved around this is for um uh, this is for uh, training purpose but it could also be relevant for assets in your building. Uh, let's say you want to monitor how your forklifts are moving around because you want to see whether they are idling or you want to see whether they are being used efficiently. Maybe you're seeing that you have one forklift too many. Um, so this data here is basically streamlines represented out of physical movement. So it's just an example of some censoring data. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, um, that's about the presentation that I have planned ahead of questions if there would be happen to be any. So